with Kawai, I came up with that name. When I was asked to teach this, uh, I looked at the name of this festival that we do, Hot Nonsense, and I thought to myself, this seems like a place where people are going to be freely expressing themselves, really being as weird as they want to be, and not so worried about uh, fitting your typical idea of what it might mean to make sense. So perhaps each of us makes our own sense in ways that are meaningful to us, but to anyone else, it might be nonsense. But all of your nonsense is quite hot. So. And well, so I worked around with that a bit, and I, and I thought, what is it that creates this, this sense of expression and who we are? How do we create a meaningful life with um, the way that ideas link together? And we find ourselves in a context, but we also create that context. And this may be something you've thought about before, but I'd like to start this off by getting a bit of background as to um, what this interest in meaning and semiotics is about. So these are the words that I will be using in this workshop that are most likely not familiar to any of you. Um, if they are familiar to you, that's great, uh, because they're packed with a lot of rich meaning. So um, I'll be talking about semiotics, which is the study of how meaning happens. What is meaning? How does it take place? And the word for that process of meaning is called semiotics. The word semiotics comes from ancient Greek, um, the term semion, which means sign. And so another way of looking at it is semiotics is the study of signs. Now, you may think that's funny, as I was just walking around with a sign advertising. <laughs> we're not just talking about the signs that you write on. Um, all the words in language itself are like signs. In the sense that suppose you have um, these wonderful things around us here. And we have a word for it, tree, yes. Um, but perhaps in uh, Espanol, they would say, arbol. 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 Uh, you know, Old English druid, which is actually the origin of the word druid, uh, and the origin of our word fr uh, of fruit, which uh, comes from fruit. I'm very interested in etymology here, but um, the, the thing about this is um, language is one of the ways that we use signs to convey meaning um, by tying a word to some sort of phenomenon that is experienced. And with the tree, we have the example of something that we observe. Uh, around us, or any kind of object, and the words represent it. But signs can happen beyond just language themselves, such as when you wave at someone, this conveys the meaning of, of a greeting, but it could also convey the meaning that you want them to go somewhere else. So exactly what a certain word means is not necessarily um, static and stuck in one place. It evolves over a time. Um, and I really took an interest in this field of semiotics because when I was studying philosophy, I really had this deep sense and interest that there's something really key about language and the words that we use to think about the world seem to have a very powerful effect on our experience. And as I was doing research for my thesis, I came upon the writings of some people in this field of semiotics. And they really had the words to describe it exactly the kind of thing that I was trying to understand, which is that rich meaning-making process. And so, perhaps the most important thing for you to keep in mind as we explore and play with these ideas. I like to use the examples of what are readily available around us. So let's say this is you and me. And um, over here is one of these nice, pretty little trees. And there's um, a way that's kind of predominant, like in, in a scientific worldview a lot of the time, or maybe we're kind of raised thinking this and being told this without really critically evaluating it, that um, we are observing this. So, 
the brain is is the eyes are looking out and scanning the world and seeing these things around us. Another way of thinking of it also, which is popular among the empiricists. captures a lot of different meanings, one of which is this dualistic sense of, of having an effect and making, making a mark on the world and, and being influenced and going with the flow. Though the meaning of the yin yang is just deeper as well, and I may talk a bit more on this later, but it really talks on the, the uh, dualistic nature of concept. And this actually is something I like to work into my semiotic theory. So like, say for example, uh, there's something that you like, you say this is good. Well, the Taoists would say, um, and this is actually a very common in Buddhist philosophy as well. Um, in, in this vein of Eastern philosophy, they would say that you're implying that the opposite of that, or that which this idea you have of good excludes, is bad or evil. You cannot have hard without soft. But if our skins were harder than wood, then these trees would actually feel quite soft to us. And just as what is good or bad to you may differ depending on the, uh, what you're bringing into the experience. And it's a constantly evolving process, because as we go about and, and play with the world and, and receive and create, um, it's constantly changing. And, and we're we're growing into new interpreters. And um, the semiotics like to view things sort of as a, a triadic relation as well. And we don't need to get overly technical with this. But say there's the, the sign, the signifier, so tree. What it signifies is what we would imagine the word is signifying. And then there's the interpreter. The, the dual. Notice how as any one aspect of this triadic relation alters, the whole is modified as well. Just as you change the length of one side of a triangle, it becomes a different shape. So you have a life-changing experience 
suddenly maybe a certain song or a certain person or food that you used to really enjoy uh, may sound different. They may feel different to you. That food may taste different. Um, as we look at this tree or that, or I look from you to you to you, all the uniqueness and standing out of each individual has a different meaning. And as we change the way that we use to convey this, uh, we use different language, tree, our bowl, etc. Um, it's all a interpenetrating relationship. So that's sort of the background of the semiotic way of thinking. And what I really want to emphasize with this is that creative aspect. I think this is especially useful when we look, look now at the context of our lives. The word context, if you look at the etymological roots of it, the etymology of the word context, con is a with, and text is like a thread. And so you're weaving together these threads, and context uh, is a weaving together. And as you can tell, the way we use it today to talk about um, the background of what creates a meaningful experience is a metaphor. Ages and ages ago, the uh, or originating word, um, I can't think of it right now, I'm not an etymology expert, but if you check out my blog posts, I link to the etymology website where you can read a little more about that, but contextus or something, the Proto-Indo-European root, they would have been talking about literally weaving together. Um, and there in itself, through the evolution of language over time, um, is case in point of this constantly transforming and really growing nature of our meaning. And, and growing is a good way to think of it, too, because um, things grow in a fractal way, and we can't really tell which direction a tree is going to grow um, in the next year to the next year, um, but it does it. And, and this is a good example. Um, and so this context, a weaving together, I think, so what is it that is woven together to create our context? It's like ideas, right? But it's more than just ideas. It's not just a simple, um, you could look at the building blocks, um, the elements. How, how deep does it go? Color, wavelength, the bits and pieces of plants. But that becomes really quite systematic when you try to take thought and try to capture all of reality in that. And so what we do is we find something that works for us, and we habitually repeat these thoughts, which I call thought patterns. And I believe that these are thought patterns because they're systematic in that they're organized in an interrelating way. <coughs> so each sign is meaningful not just on its own, but in its relatedness to the other signs that we encounter. Um, and it is also um, recurring. So we, we think of patterns as systematic and recurring. Um, and I would say that our context is furthermore an integrated pattern because it's something that we assimilate into the background of our lives, even though in the process of engaging with the world, it was really an active, um, interesting, that interactive, you know, the, the semiotic uh, circle of reciprocal understanding. Um, and once we sort of think we understand something in that way, we go forth and focus on new things because we can't be focusing on everything at once. So, what are some examples of this? One would be your identity or a role that you play, such as um, a man or a woman or any kind of gender, which I'm thankful to see that in our society we've been able to play around with that a bit more instead of taking that as something that we're frozen within. But what about your job? What do you do for a living? Am I a paralegal? Am I a cook? Am I a teacher? What are you? Um, this is a role that was given to you by society or maybe chosen by you. And maybe it was a meaningful process of fitting into that role, um, whatever you ended up doing. But as you go and go and do it, it sort of becomes something you don't think about anymore. And I wouldn't say, let's always go back and critically doubt everything. I wouldn't want to advise that. Uh, but what I, uh, one of the things that I want to get across with this workshop is that we can turn back and reflect on this process and say, what does it mean to be who I am? What identities, what, what emotions am I identifying with? What thought patterns, I should say, because an identity is just one of the thought patterns. 
You know, I really like uh, learning about the history of philosophy. Being a philosophy major and really interested in this stuff, I'm sure that's not a surprise for me. And as I was going through some more of my favorite thinkers and looking at how um, philosophical ideas have changed hands and evolved and been elaborated in different ways over time, uh, it really enchanted me to think, um, wow, I kind of fit into this. Those of us who are engaging with these ideas today, and I don't just mean those of us who go and study philosophy and who go and, and really focus on that, though I think that's a really fun thing. I would encourage people to do it at least casually on the side. But these um, philosophical ideas for me are actually um, really present in our society uh, and, and in our lives. They've, they've become so much part of our context um, that when you start to see who first said that, uh, it, it really makes you get a feel for what this context is, what this pattern is that you're fitting into. It's like a textile, you know? If you think of linking um, these thought patterns that are systematized together within your mind into forming something like an identity or a role uh, or whatever kind of context you fall within, that is like a textile, which fits with the etymology of context. And then each of our little uh, textiles, these beautiful, intricate works of art, so I'm really an advocate for looking at our going into life as though we are the artists of our existence, by the way. Um, we all fit into each other's lives. We're here together, and maybe we're not so separate. Um, and it's like a quilt, a patching together of these textiles with threads weaving through that connect us all. I found this lovely comment so, so fun to think about, and I thought I'd share it with the workshop. It's a little bird who's, who's being semi, it's, it's noticing these patterns are everywhere. And um, observing and getting engaged and then asking the question, am I a pattern? And that last panel, it was really quite uh, serendipitous that I found this because the bird itself is full of these wonderful swirling markings and the wings, the fractal growth of the feathers. And there it is fitting into this interweaving. Uh, it looks like a textile, like, like, uh, like a quilt. Um, and so um, I want you to ask that. Am I a pattern? I, uh, one thing that I think I'm making clear here is that these thought patterns are part of our lives, whether we like them or not. But I'm not here claiming that we are, in fact, those patterns. After all, as I said before, if we try to break down every nuance of detail of our experience, we end up with a lot of words, words and words and words if we're using language. And we're creating very intricate patterns, but eventually the meaning breaks down. It seems that there's something indescribable and ineffable about our experience. And for me, I like to take that as um, where I come at the semiotics is bringing in this sort of, I guess I could call it a Buddhistic way of relating to the world as pure consciousness before language. So I was looking at a uh, massive rainbow the other day. It was so splendid to see. And I was counting the colors, you know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. But we have this whole spectrum of visible light. And we say the rainbow is these seven colors. But if you look real closely, clearly there's colors in between those colors. And there's colors in between the in between those colors. And eventually you would be talking infinitely if you tried to come up with a name you know why don't we say that the rainbow is cerulean chartreuse vermilion emerald and lavender um i mean it seems kind of arbitrary that we choose these colors as the primary colors and this is how we say that the rainbow is but the rest of what we're seeing uh can never fully be described you could keep talking for an eternity you wouldn't be able to describe it in psychology um currently the the way, I suppose, is to say that we have nine basic human emotions, and don't ask me to name them all right now. And there's certainly a lot that we can understand about each other by viewing ourselves in terms of these nine basic emotions. 
Um, but I'm sure earlier on in psychological theory, there was a different number. Uh, in, in the movie Inside Out by Pixar, one of my favorite Pixar movies, there's five basic emotions. <laughs> How many basic emotions are we going to have in another 20 years? I, I'm not sure exactly, but it seems to me that um, as useful as these terms, happy, sad, afraid, in love, shock, disgust, fear, they name uh, a static moment, uh, but isn't emotion really like a flow that's constantly going? It's like trying to say this is this emotion is like trying to cup a river and, and divert it into here, but it keeps flowing past you. You know, and, and I don't want to de denigrate the sciences at all. I think it's very powerful what they're doing, but it would be a mistake to try to reduce life to all that. And, and I, I think it's important for me to touch on that in these workshops because um, this meaning making that we do conceptually, you know, I'm talking about thought patterns that form our context, um, is what I really love encouraging people to be aware of and, and play around with it. Say, what happens if I start to think in different terms? Um, I just don't want people to get caught up and constricted in it. Baba Ram Das used to like to tell a story um, about, well, I'll tell you the story and then we'll see how we can relate it to when I'm talking about it. So um, there's this guy who'd done really well for himself in some Middle Eastern village and he wanted to go get a well-tailored suit to show that he'd done well for himself. And he had heard that Zumbak the tailor was very excellent, the best tailor around. And so he goes to this shop and he says, hey Zumbak, can you make me a suit? Sure, sure, I'll make you a suit. So a few days later he comes back and it's the most intricately wonderful fabric. Maybe it looks something like this, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, he slides into it and, and he's looking in the mirror and it's quite lovely. But he says, Zumbak, uh, one of these sleeves is shorter than the other. And what did? And, and Zumbak goes and says, no, 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 it's not the sleeve, it's the way that you're standing here. And he pulls his arm back and says, there, see, it's even. And so the guy's like, all right, and he's, he's looking, looking in the mirror. And he's, Zumbak, there's, there's this bunched up fabric in the back. I don't really like that it's all bunched up like that. And Zumbak says, no, 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 it's not the suit. It's the way that you're standing here and shoves his head down. Just like crouch down like this, there, and the suit fit him perfectly. All right, so he goes out, he's on the bus, and uh, someone on the bus comes to him and says, Wow, that is an amazing suit. Is that the work of Zumbak the tailor? And the man says, Oh, yes, it is. Uh, how did you know? And the man says, Because only a tailor as skilled as Zumbak could fit a cripple like you. <laughs> <laughs> There's this seductive aspect to these ways of identifying that we become so familiar with. It's like a suit that we wear, you know, this ego, this self, whatever you want to call it. Um, we try to fit into it, and when society gives us these roles, we try even harder to fit so we can make people happy. And um, you might end up feeling a bit bent and broken and wonder what's wrong with you, but what if it's actually the suit? And in Baba Ram Das, I was pretty inspired to do this workshop by some talks of his that I was listening to, and he really likes to hit on the way that society does this. But I'd also like to notice the way that we do it to ourselves. What kind of suit, what kind of textiles are we weaving as we engage in the world? And how can we, uh, with deep creativity, with, with a sense of, of being aware of this, start to think, hmm, what happens if I do this a little bit? What happens if I change this? And maybe it can be a bit afraid to step out of what you're used to. And maybe you start dressing a little bit differently. And maybe you start reading something new to challenge yourself. Uh, maybe you engage in that conversation about something that makes you uncomfortable because you haven't questioned it. But I think it's very important for us to explore these new perspectives and constantly be exploring. And I say this word a lot, playing with life. And play gives this sense of being like, la-di-da, you know, I don't care what happens. But it doesn't have to be like that. Uh, it can certainly be sincere, if not serious. You know, you might say serious play or more sincere play, like um, when musicians are really in the flow on stage, they're playing with meaning. 
right there. They're playing with these patterns of music, right? And we get caught into that, and the crowd is united, and they're playing, right? But there's also this serious feeling about that. It's not like, oh, this is just some joke. Nothing against jokes, by the way. Um, but just don't take it too that much as like, oh, just let go and don't care at all when I say play. Because there's something to be said for caring, too, and compassion. And another thing I wanted to talk about here is um, how fate plays a role. Um, because I'm really interested in how we create the meaning in our reality. Um, but there's also those aspects that it seems we're born into that we don't really have a choice. Like, for example, this body. Um, with this fragile skin, we, we get cold real easily, we have to protect ourselves, we have to eat. We can only see this so many spectrum of light, like in the rainbow. Imagine how much more we could see if we had a wider spectrum. That is one aspect of our fate. There's certain things that maybe we might someday be able to change, but it's not something um, that is immediately apparent of having chosen. Um, or, you know, perhaps you get struck by a bolt of lightning. That would be fate. Um, though more um, re relevant to most of our lives, I would say, is the parents we're born with, town we grew up in, and those things that uh, we do find ourselves in. It's just that it's not always us finding ourselves in context. It is always a constant finding ourselves and creating. It's like if you sit and join a drum circle and you feel that beat playing, and that beat carries you along, and it's kind of like, how did I fall into this? Uh, but then you want to participate and be a part of that, and it's this beautiful play again with the creativity and the receptivity. And when you find that perfect balance, it's like it unlocks a flow state. And and I really enjoy that too. Now there's another story I wanted to tell today too. Um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who's alive right now, Tenzin Gyatso. Uh, he is the reincarnation of Chenrezig the Buddha of compassion. And this Buddha was very much dedicated to imbuing people's hearts with compassion. And you can see, I love watching uh, the Dalai Lama's talks uh, because he's really steadfast in his suggestion that people have more compassion in their lives. And what exactly does that mean? And I think he's really one of the most creative people that I've seen. Especially if you watch one of his talks where um, he's not trying to speak English because it's a very difficult language barrier. Um, and he has a really good translator. Things that he says, wow. And in one of his talks, uh, there was a question and answer session at the end. The person asked him, His Holiness, can you tell us about a work of art that has moved you deeply? And I was waiting for him to answer. I thought, what's he going to say? Some amazing painting that I've never heard of? Some esoteric Buddhist scripture that I need to know? And His Holiness laughed. And he said, the nuclear bomb is a very powerful form of technology. And the aeroplane, too. It can cause a great deal of death and destruction. What a surprise for him to say that. And he went on to say that any form of art or technology can be used to hurt people if you do it with anger in your heart. Even a needle, which is used for weaving beautiful textiles. If you're angry and stab someone in the face, you can really hurt them with it. A knife that can cook the most delicious meals. We all know the harm that a knife can cause. And at the end of his little answer, he said, even the Buddha Sutra can cause harm if used in the hands of the anger. And then he went on to the next question. Leaving empty that implicit part, the Buddha Sutra is also contains wisdom about how we can live with more compassion. The knife can cook the most delicious meals, the needle can sew the most intricate works of art, the aeroplane can convey us to far off places that we've never imagined, and the nuclear bomb is born of nuclear fission, which is one of the most miraculous sources of energy that we've ever discovered. In his faith as the Buddha of compassion, the reincarnation of this Buddha, His Holiness took a question about art and remained dedicated in emphasizing his lesson of compassion. But he also really demonstrated this creative role 
of uh, playing meaning into our lives because he interpreted their question and responded to it in a very unexpected way that he still fit into um, the context of what he was trying to do at the time. And that's something I really love to see with anyone when I see that person is really um, enriching my life just by being who they are. They're really flowing with what they're creating. And it's not like I'm saying you've got to try so hard to do it. I think it really comes naturally if you just start to open yourself to the magic. And magic's a good word because if you look at a lot of the magical practices, um, if any of you are into occult type things, you may be a bit familiar with that. A lot of it, it uses ritual and words and, and spells um, to create this meaningful uh, effect on reality. And does it have an effect? Is it something that could be measured by scientific instruments? I don't know, but to the witch or wizard, it could indeed have a very powerful effect. And I hope I've been able to convey through this little talk um, that the very act of creating meaning in itself, however magical you may think it is, is just as powerful as any spell. Thank you.